Hi, everybody. I'm Michael. And uh, this talk's going to be basically about building a container supervisor. So it'll be focused around like container D and the Docker integration and some things around the runtime and kind of like what we learned while we were building it, some of the architecture things, some of the recent changes in the Linux kernel that let us do some of these features. And so I guess starting off a little bit about myself, I started working on Docker around the point three release. I think the first release that like I became a maintainer and did was the point five. And if anyone remembers that one, it's the one where we went from binding on localhost to a Unix socket. So it was basically that release that broke everyone. And then kind of after that, I did everything from like Docker Web UI, uh, wrote libcontainer, uh, nsinit, which was a tool that we used to build libcontainer so that we didn't have to build Docker every time we made a change. We could run this little thing. And then later, nsinit evolved into run C when we did the open container initiative. And so I've been working on that a lot. I'm a maintainer on the runtime side of OCI. And then recently I started working on the container D, which is a container supervisor for kind of managing all these OCI containers and abstracting away the execution layer in Docker. So like first to give you kind of the background on container D, it's a really small, fast, and lightweight container supervisor. And the container part's very important. It's not a process supervisor. You may have heard, like, whenever this came out, someone's like, oh, Docker's trying to replace system D. That's totally not true at all, because like, we're focused on containers. And the use cases for containers and the features that a lot of people expect are totally different from a regular process supervisor. And so another way of thinking about container D is like it's a run C multiplexer or OCI multiplexer because nowadays there's no runtime code in Docker at all. Docker is unable to create containers. Container D is, uh, regardless of its name, it can't really create containers at all. All the runtime logic is in this kind of OCI layer from the spec to the implementations. And so container D basically just multiplexes all these things together and then adds lifecycle operations on top of those. And that's basically all it does. It's kind of meant to be boring. It's kind of meant to not be changed, not be used. It's kind of sitting at the bottom of our stack in Docker where people can innovate on the higher level things, build out swarm, all these cool stuff. And this thing's the boring thing at the bottom that just launches containers and abstracts uh, the execution away. So there was a couple reasons why I wanted to build ContainerD. And some of its legacy, if you've contributed to Docker before and have looked at the runtime part, you may remember exec drivers. And that's kind of like the execution v1 layer of whenever we went from LXE to libcontainer, we kind of had this abstraction in the exec driver path of some portable config structs that converted all your information from a Docker image and your Docker run CLI command into this config. And then it would either invoke LXE or libcontainer to start the, to start the containers. And so container D was a chance to rethink kind of execution v2 and how that would work. And with OCI, we already have kind of the abstraction of what's the IO of a container. So everything for the inputs to what's expected by the user on the runtime environment for a container is defined in kind of the open container format. And so we have this kind of portable format. We don't have to think about that anymore. We don't need this abstraction inside Docker. We just need an abstraction to handle these OCI runtimes. And so the Run C integration was a major factor for starting work on ContainerD because we could have just did a couple replaces in the Docker exec driver code base and everything would have been fine. But 
kind of rethinking of how a container supervisor works and having a chance with this run C integration to build container D was a big motivation. And it also allows us to kind of decouple the execution from the runtime environment. So when you think about Docker containers, you think about an image, and then you have this container, which is almost like an, a an image is like a class, and the container is this instance of it. And so you have all this data in the image, but at runtime, you really don't need any of that. You just need the root file system mounted somewhere. And so the whole API to container D is, it's a gRPC API, but you give it a ID and then a path to the OCI bundle, and then that's it. There's no other parameters in this API. There's nothing else to specify. And it kind of decouples how images are stored, how um, Docker handles layers, all that stuff from the execution and runtime environment. And another big uh, reason was there are other problems such as when you uh, restart or like upgrade the Docker daemon, like all your containers would die. And it was like the biggest production issue we've had. And it wasn't a hard problem to solve on its own, but when you see what a lot of Docker users expect from Docker, they expect logging, uh, containers with TTYs and attach, then things like that made it much more complicated to implement something like that. So when we kind of looked at like how could we implement this, um, how much do we need to change, doing this in Containerd kind of made sense. So those are kind of some of the reasons why. And uh, some of the other reasons of like why this was really interesting to me was back in Docker like point three, like Docker was cool, Docker was fast. You'd do a Docker run Ubuntu bash and things would, it was almost like instant. And nowadays I think we take it for granted. Like it's still fast, but we expect like 100 millisecond start times and all this. If something, if you have a blip and it slows down, it's like, ah, oh, Docker's so slow. So with Container D, I wanted to kind of bring that like sense of speed back. And so kind of the way it's architected is with a event loop and we get different uh, benchmarks like this where, hey, I want to start 100 containers. Okay, that's one second or a little bit over one second here. And uh, during development, kind of, when you start Container D, we made a lot of tools and things like this. So, like, I can do this live benchmark here of starting 100 containers, and even though it's on my laptop and I'm doing a presentation, we still get around one second to start a, a hundred on the system, and then I can list those with Run C or whatever, and we can see we have a hundred running that quickly, and so kind of a big motivation was to bring back that speed, bring back that feeling of Docker being super fast and making sure that the lower levels can support anything else we can do at the higher levels. And so a lot of that's done with the way it's architected with an event loop. And it's kind of like an anti-pattern of Go, I think, but coming from like systems development and how we thought about uh, supervisors in Go, it was, we would fork off a process in a Go routine, call wait, and then that blocked until it was done, and then we cleaned it up. And if you've written other process supervisors in the past, you would listen to like SIG child events and reap those as they came in. And so we started out, since Container D is basically a supervisor or process monitor, like going with that architecture, and we moved that architecture to like all the commands in Container D. And it helps in a lot of different ways. And mostly because when you launch a container, it's a lot of system level, um, system and hardware specific on the container start time. So it's not really our user land code that's slowing it down. There's a bunch of mounts. There's namespace creation clones, netlink calls. So you could launch containers like 100 concurrently but it's actually slower when you do uh, mass amounts of concurrently to start containers. 
if we use this event loop, we can control kind of the queue of how we start these. So you can still send off 100 concurrent or 500 concurrent uh, requests to start containers to containerd, but it will queue them internally and process them as it goes. And currently it has like a 10, 10 worker limit where it takes these requests in and starts containers 10 at a time. When one finishes, it keeps going. And if we run benchmarks and change that level, you can see as you increase the concurrency more, things actually slow down. They don't get faster. So it's kind of, as we built this, kind of rethinking like everything we thought about containers and like maybe it's not a good idea just to slam the system with 500 requests to start these things. Maybe if we slow it down, it's actually going to be faster. And so that's kind of some of the things that we thought through when we had this event loop. And so the second part, which was a really big thing, was implementing daemonless containers. And so like, we would have issues, uh, support IRC people saying, like, every, you guys push Docker releases a lot. I like to have the newest thing. But every time I upgrade Docker, all my containers die, my database goes down, and all that stuff. And so while we're reworking this execution layer, we wanted to kind of fix this daemonless issue. And so there was a lot of things that had to be done kind of at the execution level and how we handle things. And it starts with like state. And so managing state is pretty easy when you don't have any. And that's basically the idea that how container D works. It doesn't keep anything in memory. And so when you rethink about how Docker was working previously, it had lists of containers, containers, individual containers with state. It would tell you whether they're running, they're not. And if it would go down and come back up, you had to somehow restore all this in-memory state. And when you want daemonless containers, it's easier to treat things like it wasn't yours in the first place. Like, uh, if, you, if you don't store anything, there's nothing to reconcile or come back. You can do it ad hoc. There are a couple things that happen in process, and it has more to do with FIFOs and, or open pipes for standard I.O. and events. And I'll kind of explain that in the next few slides. But overall, there's no like maps of containers, no lists of containers in container D. And so um, we can do like another one of these uh, benchmarks. We can start 100, kill container D, start it again. And it, it notices that they're there and says like, oh, hey, I restored this. But there really isn't anything added in its state. And you can interact with these containers exactly like you would whether you killed it or not. And so it kind of took a rewrite of the architecture to make it that way. But it turns out to be a lot better pattern in the future. And another thing is when you're dealing with like systems level code slash run as your friend, if you do have to persist anything on disk, so what we learned is a container is basically a process. And so you only have to save the PID and the path to like where the containers bundle is. And from those two things, you can re recreate everything about this container. So you don't have to have a complex uh, struct in memory telling you, like, oh, it had this much uh, memory limit, it has this much CPUs allocated. You can use the PID, look in proc, you can get the C group paths back out, and then you can get all the limits back, you can get the paths to all the namespace FDs, you can use the PID and do uh, set and S and or Docker exec to add more processes to the container just from this one number. And so when you save these and run, since run is a temporary file system, it fixes the problem of did container D crash or did the machine crash? And so if the machine crashes and reboots, run is wiped out because it's tempfs and there's no PIDs in there for us to look at and try to like uh, recreate the containers if someone asks us to do an operation on it. If container D crashed and came back up, those files are still there and we can go on our way and do the operations as needed. So 
it's a lot better than saving PIDs or other kind of ephemeral runtime data on a stateful drive. So use things like run when you're dealing with that type of data. And so the other problems with like daemonless containers are exit codes and wait. So uh, waiting for a process that isn't your child. Um, TTYs and standard I.O. in a container. Um, this isn't a big issue for systems that are logging outside, but people expect Docker run, dash TI, Ubuntu bash to work. And if Docker dies and comes back up, I expect I have a live terminal session back there like nothing happened. So that was a big challenge. Um, there's challenges around reparenting and the rules for that where we still want to know the instance that a container exits, but we can't wait on it. So we have to figure that out. And in container D, this is kind of all facilitated by a shim process that fixes kind of these three issues that we hit when we started working on daemonless containers. And so overall, the basic architecture of container D is we have the container D process, and it launches these shims. And then the shim launches run C, which will exec the container exit, and the actual containers process becomes a child of the shim. And so you can think of the shim as like a one-to-one -to, -one to the container. Every container has a shim process, and it handles the various things like uh, getting the exit code for the process, notifying container D or other higher levels when it exits, and um, holding open the parent side of a TTY or the standard I.O. So going through like these three problems that we hit, the first one was exit statuses and basically just uh, notifications whenever you can't wait on a container. And so for this, we used FIFOs and a file, basically. And the FIFO, if you don't know about it, it's basically a pipe with an inode, and that's it. But it does have some differences between regular pipes, and they're both a blessing and a curse. If you haven't worked with them before, they can be frustrating if you don't know what you're doing. So there are two ways to use a FIFO. You can use it to transfer data or you can use it for its blocking semantics like a, a regular pipe. And so the FIFOs used in the exit, exit status scenario and for exit events, it's used in the blocking case. We don't actually send any data through the FIFO. And we do that with the close exec flag. And so what happens is when we launch the shim, it will create a FIFO and open it as write only and it opens it with the close exec flag. And so whenever someone else goes by, opens up this FIFO read only on the other side, it will block until either like you send data or it's closed. And so with close exec, the shim can wait for the containers process to exit because it is the direct um, parent of the containers process and then it exits and it doesn't even have to close the pipe. The close exec handles it when the shim process exits, but then it unblocks the, anyone waiting on that and it happens very quickly and it's a very good alternative to uh, handling like a wait for when you can't wait. And so this helps in a couple different ways. Whenever container D goes down and comes back up, it just reopens the the kind of exit status FIFO for the shim, and then it gets the events of whenever the container dies immediately without having to do a bunch of reparenting magic and things like that. And so I have like a little demo showing this off. This is just some quick little C code of kind of the idea of how you would make a FIFO and open it. I'll show you the code here. Uh, Right. So I have this little program, and basically all it does is we create a FIFO, and then we open it in our current process as write only with close exec, 
and we just do a pause at the end and uh, nothing else here. So if I take this code and I run it, and then I now have this kind of exit FIFO file in my terminal, if I just cat this, then this cat blocks. And it blocks until this close exec program exits. So I can just kind of control C on that. And then the cat unblocks. And this actually works for like multiple subscribers and different things like that. And so it's a very simple way of getting this cross process uh, blocking mechanic working without having to be the direct parent of these various processes and things like that. So it was one thing where we were working on these daemonless containers. We had this problem. And it's a pretty effective way of, of handling it. And so the next problem is like standard I.O. And so this includes logging, uh, TTYs, standard in, so reading, writing. And this is where we use FIFOs again, but we don't use the blocking semantics of them. We use them for data transfer. And it's basically where you can create a FIFO. Open, we open it up in run C whenever we're creating the container and dupe these FIFOs to the container's standard I.O. 012. And then it's basically like you have the container standard I.O. as a file. And then you can open this up at any time and reconnect to its standard air, standard out streams, or standard in right, right back into this file. And so this helps with both container D can go down, Docker can go down, containers can keep running, and then when they're restored, they reopen all these FIFOs, and they have full access to the st container's standard I.O. for logging, or if you have an interactive TTY session and stuff. So TTYs are a little different. You can't really dupe this fi FIFO to those. You create the, the two PTYs. You give one side to the container. You keep one side open in the shim. And we basically just do a copy in that case between uh, the shim will open up the standard in FIFO and copy to the PTY on its side. And that's how kind of TTYs work through, through this. There are a couple issues with FIFOs, though, and how we're using this. And the basic one is they have a buffer. And so if you can imagine that Docker's handling all the logs, you have a container running, it's writing the standard error, standard out logging. Docker goes down. No, one, no one's reading any data out of that FIFO at this time. And so the default buffer is 64K for uh, pipes and FIFOs in the kernel. And so after a container logs more than 64K of data, it's going to block. But when we think about this feature of daemonless containers, it's not meant for you to start a container, kill Docker, and then leave it for a month. It's meant for, like, OK, I'm upgrading to the next version, or Docker crashed, uh, container D crashed. It's going to get restarted by the supervisor anyway. It's for short amounts of time. and so. This is not too big of an issue, but if you do have an application that logs um, intense amount of data, there is a way for you to modify the buffer size. And so you can go to proxys fs, and then there's a pipe max size file. And you can change the default size for pipes on your system, change it from 64 or more. I, I haven't tried it too much. I don't know what's like the max uh, buffer size you can add. But it'll give you some, some extra room if you do have very um, intense apps that log a lot and you have some extraordinary downtime on upgrades, things like that. So, so overall, like FIFOs have been really good for this reattach use case because if we work with pipes, like normally, as soon as one side goes down, the other side gets clo closed. And that's the whole kind of blocking mechanic of pipes. And we want that for one use case, but not for like the data transfer use case. And so kind of like the second issue, like after we figure out how do we get the exit status, how do we get the exit events, how do we handle I.O. of the container, 
It's how do we handle reparenting of the processes whenever kind of the higher level processes can go away and your container process is expected to keep running. And so the basic workflow of kind of like the three processes when starting a container is you have the shim, the shim starts run C, run C does all the containerization work, launches the process, and then we want run C to exit because there's no reason to leave that process hanging around. And so we need to be able to reparent the container process. So the MySQL D or the bash session that you have running in the container needs to be reparented to the shim so that the shim can do the actual way and then facilitate like letting container D or Docker know the exit status and all that. And so there's some issues with reparenting. Like if you don't know the rules, it's basically your parent is the process that forked you. If your parent dies, your new parent is PID1. And up until kernel 3.4, that was the case. But with uh, Linux 3.4, we got this new command uh, PR set child subreaper. And a lot of people don't know about this thing, but it's probably one of the best things that's happened to like people writing process supervisors and all this stuff. Uh, I guess I have a typo there. It's PRCTL is the command that you use to set this thing. And basically, it affects your calling process. And whatever process you call this in, it basically fulfills the rule of an int whenever descendant processes die or, and such. So I have a small demo with this. And this will be kind of the basic output that you'll see. We will have a main that will start, and then there's two forks. So the main kind of forks off this parent process, and then this parent forks off another child. And then we kill the first fork from the parent and see how the child process gets reparented when that happens. And so I can go in here, and I can show you this code. So at the top of this file here, I basically have this little flag that enables a subreaper or not. And this is called a PRCTL. And when you pass this option, it takes like a 0 or a non-zero. And with a 0, it basically disables it. With a, anything non-zero, it enables the subreaper for the process. And kind of going down, we, we're in our main, so I get the PID of our main process. We do the initial fork to get our so-called parent here. And then our parent does another fork inside of it to create our uh, fake little child here. And so we'll print out like the child's PID and then its parent's PID. We'll make it sleep a little just to like synchronize things. And by the time this starts sleeping, our parent process from the initial fork should exit. We'll see the PID. And then once the sleep is done, the child process should be reparented to something. And then we'll just kind of like um, print out some extra debug data here in the console. So if I run this now, we'll have kind of our main parent is 42. And then it spawns a child process of 44 with its parent being 43. Without the subreaper set, when the, the uh, process 43 exits, the child gets reparented to 1942, which is, I guess, a pretty cool PID. But uh, if we PSA, if we grab for this thing, um, see that 1942 is kind of S bin upstart, and this is act. This is an Ubuntu machine running system D, so they have this little shim in here. So we're not necessarily seeing PID1. So this thing probably has the subreaper set as well, where things get reparented to it. But this is basically showing that when you don't have this subreaper set, then things will get reparented to system in it, whether that's PID1 or something higher in the process tree with the subreaper after 3.4. So if we run this again with the subreaper flag, we get the same thing, but 
we'll see that the child process, instead of getting reparented to 1942, it gets reparented to 52, which is our main. And so that allows us to, in the shim, we set this subreaper. So run C does its work, it launches the container, run C goes away, and then everything gets reparented back to the shims process. And then um, if you notice some of the data that's different here at the end, um, there's a little printf. I did a wait for on the PID for the child one. On the first one without the subreaper, you get no such process or no child processes. On this last one with the subreaper set, we we're actually able to do a wait. And so it's a really nice feature. 3.4 came out like four years ago, so everyone should have the ability to use this thing if you're working on supervisors for containers or regular process supervisors and things like that. The only thing it doesn't solve is reparenting processes from inside of a container. So when we were working on this, a lot of people was like, oh, the subreaper is awesome, so this is going to fix all our zombie issues. And there's actually special semantics around PID1. Whenever a container has a PID1, it doesn't cross that boundary. So we couldn't create a kind of generic reaper on the host system with the subreaper that just reaps anything from inside containers and out. They kind of get blocked on the container's PID1. So the only true way to fix the zombie issue with containers is to run a Reaper as PID1 inside the container. Um, the subreaper currently won't fix that at this time. So maybe in the future with some extra patches, we could get that to work, but currently it, it can't solve that issue. So kind of like after that, we got all the daemonless work done. We have uh, standard I.O. done. The last part was more of a synchronization for different features that we have with Containerd. And one specific one was the OOM problem. And this was basically, how do we connect to the OOM signal handler and know if a container OOM'd before the user's process is started? And this is kind of a generic issue that a lot of supervisors have. And with containers and the work we did with like run C, it was a lot easier to fix. So the current workflow prior to like our, our changes in like the runtime in container D was you would, you would do run C start and then a container ID. And it would create the container and immediately exec the user's process like MySQL D. And if a container had like a low memory limit, like two meg, by the time it did an exec and we, we figured out, okay, it was running, let's connect the OOM handler, it could have already OOM'd and died. And we couldn't tell whether it died on its own, it died because of an error, or it died because it ran out of memory. And so one of the things that we worked on um, kind of below the process supervisor was getting this runtime workflow working where we have a create, a start, and a delete. And by splitting these three different kind of uh, events in a container's life cycle, it gives you the chance to connect things like stats and OOM before the user's process is running. And so before MySQL starts, we can already have the OOM handler hooked up and the, uh, like be collecting stats. So um, basically create, it initializes all the namespaces, does all the mounts, um, and then it blocks right before it does an exec of like, if you specified sleep 10, it blocks right before we do the exec of sleep 10. And then the start command will, will signal it to unblock, it does the exec, and then it exits, and the user's process is running. So in between the time between create and start, we have a lot of freedom. We could have did this with like hooks and things like that, but when you have kind of this, this ability to initialize the container fully and go from nothing to a full container just without the user's processes running, you, can, you have a lot more flexibility for networking setups, 
uh, messing with the mount namespace, different IPC namespaces, things like that. And you even have the PID namespace created. So um, you basically have the entire full container running where you can do stateful operations to the namespaces without the user's process executing while you're like bringing up network interfaces and things like that. And so this really helped with the OOM part. And I can kind of show you the new kind of flow. So I have a container here. The root of S is just called busy, and we have this config file. And so the way this works is you can type run C, create, test. And so this creates the container. And as soon as it returns, the container is fully up. Like it has all its namespaces. If I do run C list, we can see we have our test container here. It's got a PID. It's in the created state. And then we can do all our things like attach to OM. We can attach to stats, set up networking, things like that. And then after you create it, then all you have to do to signal for the user's process to start running is just say, OK, run C start, and then the container ID of test. And then this container just like echoes hi, DockerCon. And it's pretty simple when you look at it like this, but having that split, especially when you're working on higher level supervisors and implementing a lot of the features that people expect from like, like, like most people today expect stats from containers. They expect containers to be paused, resumed, um, and have a lot more features than you would with just regular processes. And having the ability to use containers and split up how it's created, how it started, uh, really helps out to get like, correct data from that stuff. And so yeah, I, I showed that part. And then uh, basically all my code here is on my GitHub. If you want to see these close exec files or how the sub reaper works, you can go here and uh, my presentation and the code is uploaded for all that. And that's all I have. So thanks. I think we may have time for questions.